March is International Women's History and Social Work Month, and somebody who makes up the very fabric of yachting history and the history of Northrop and Johnson is Annie Avery. We took a few moments to talk to Annie about her amazing experience. So Annie Avery, you've been a sales broker with Northrop and Johnson for a long time, but before that, what, what were you doing before Northrop and Johnson? Well, before Northrop and Johnson in the yachting industry still, uh, one very much uh, part of the whole story is that my family, which consisted at the time of three sisters, I'm from a family of five girls, a brother-in-law and a six-month-old baby, bought a boat. We dropped out or dropped into another life and bought a boat and sailed for a year. Oh, wow. So I got the, whole the boat. Family? The whole or, family? Wow. Yeah. Five no, Girls. three three of the five. Okay. And then my oldest sister, married to Fred, they had, by the time we went, they had a six-month-old baby. Oh so God. we took her, too. You can imagine people wondering, what what, what is this uh, relationship here that's going on? So we had a wonderful time. And at the very end of that time, I decided that I wanted to skip her professionally. And that was really a personal motive. What had happened was we were all reading books at the time, which was such a great blessing for us because we'd all been in very heavy-duty professional jobs. So here we were. What what was your job Uh, before then? I was an adjunct faculty at University of Washington. Oh, wow. So I felt that the only thing I could read were things in Spanish or French or other languages and because I was in the College of Education at the time. And this way, on our trip, we all had a novel going and what we called a heavy. So one of the books that I had read during the trip was a book called Androgyny that a friend had recommended. I finally read it. And it was written by a psychologist named June Singer. And this was, think how many years ago this was. And she said that in the future, any person, whether it's you in your male body or me in my female body, is going to need to know how to act from a gender point of view, each gender. So I would need to know how to be more male in certain instances, have that male energy, or more female in another instance. But it wasn't relegated anymore to what kind of body you were in or or a propensity to be female or male. So I decided that it was important for me to really learn what responsibility was about. I'd been in that academic situation, and I'd also been with TV. But in the academic situation, I felt that you never really knew the uh, repercussions or the outset, the um, the impact of what you did. It would take so long to get that. And that with a boat, I would know if I ran on the reef or if I, and I would be responsible yeah. as a captain. The you consequences are, are pretty immediate on a yacht, aren't they? Yeah. And, it, and you have to do something about it right away. It's not put it to the back burner. So I went about getting a job on a boat, got my license. What got did my your, your family think of that, going from acad- an academic life and a professional life to being a yacht captain? Well, they're they're all for doing whatever uh, you think is the right thing for you to do, so I certainly didn't have any pushback. In fact, I had really great help from my brother-in-law in in particular and from, um, from John Barry, who was the family that I learned to sail with originally about eight years prior to our family doing the trip that we did. So, so then you find yourself as a yacht captain. Now, um, I think it's important to state that I, I view you as a, as a sales broker. Um, you're a female sales broker, but above all, you are a sales broker and a successful sales broker. But there are sort of um, prejudices and preconceptions about what genders should do. At the time, were you one of the only women captains out there, or, or was that quite a normal thing. No, when I did it, I was the third in the whole Caribbean that was doing it. And I have to say, if it hadn't been for all the men that helped me in my life, I never would have been able to do it. But I'll give you two examples of really important things that um, two men in my life told me. And the first one was Don Barry. He said, 
One thing to be sure of, Annie, don't think that you need to be totally trained to do any job, including this one. Women have a tendency to think that they need to have everything in place before they're entitled to even put themselves on the field. He said that is not the case. That is not how anybody learns, so just remember that. And then after my trip with my family, and as we were winding up everything there, and I was talking to Fred about my... my uh, concern about being able to handle the mechanics of a boat because we were from a very low systems boat, right? I didn't have any problem with the sailing. We sailed in and out of anchor, any of the hospitality, any of the captaining management, but I was a little concerned about engines and refrigeration systems and things like that, and it hadn't been any of my background. And my brother-in-law was so darling. He took, he put his arm around me and he says, Annie, he said, look out there. And we were looking, we were in Charlotte Amali, right? And so he sweeps his hand over the harbor and he says, Annie, look out there. Do you think all of those skippers have gone to Detroit Diesel School? <laughs> and I said, no. And he said, no, they haven't. And you're going to learn exactly how they learned. You're going to learn your emergency. You're going to know your emergency situations ahead of time. So if your engine runs away from you, you know to stuff the air intake. You know how to shift to the other side, tack to the other side if you lose a shroud, and then hook up your topping lid. Then after that, you're going to do just what they do. You're going to read the manual, try and fix it yourself. If you can't do that, you're going to have a friend help you. And if you can't do that, you hire somebody and pay a lot of attention and hope you can do it the next yeah. time. So you learn on the field. You learn, mm -hmm. I guess, occasionally from mistakes, but by actually getting stuff done. Yeah. It's interesting because we, we spoke yesterday with uh, Kristen Klein, uh -huh. and one of the things that came out of the discussion with her is that she basically got up and did stuff. She got on a train, moved to where the yachts were, got herself a job, did her STCW, got a job. So you have to pursue your dreams, don't you? Yes. So how long were you at sea for as a, as a captain? So I did it about the decade. Uh, I did it for about a decade. Um, I had a, in the middle of it, I did an African expedition, came back, decided to still be on the boats. I was an adventure. That was definitely part of my makeup and still is. Uh, and so I did that uh, and then came back to the boats for three more years before I said, you know, I really don't want to be a fed ship driver when I'm 60. That's not my, my thing. So get on land and figure out what you're going to do. So I didn't have a, th a place to go to at the time. I, I had to decide when I was off the boats. So you got off the boats and what was your next step? So my next step was to decide what I was going to do if I was going to go back to television, communications, which I love, or if I was going to stay in the yachting industry. And Barry said to me, you know, Annie, you have a lot of equity in this field already. You've run uh, aluminum boat, wooden boat, many different kinds of boats. You've done charter, you've done private. So is there anything in the field that you could uh, just transition to? So I decided to stay in the industry. Uh, the idea originally was maybe a little less time than I actually have spent here. But um, one of the reasons I really wanted to do it was to encourage people to do it and to be a cheerleader. Because I knew from my own experience, all the people that tell you all the reasons you can't do it and that you shouldn't do it and that it's dangerous and that it's much too risky. When, when we had my niece with us and she was only six months old, people were saying to my sister, oh, how could you possibly be so irresponsible? Oh, really? Et cetera, so yeah. And so what was the decision that you made after coming back to shore Deciding to stay in the yachting industry, did you then go immediately into brokerage? Yes, and pretty much. straight away Northrop and Johnson, or were there other companies first? Uh, no, no, I was first with Bartram and Brackenhoff, and because I wanted to learn from somebody who was very reputable, I hadn't been in a business per sure. se. And they have in a that great way. reputation with sailing great yachts. Great reputation, um, yeah. mm -hmm. and then I moved to Florida. And I was with Jetsy for a while, and that was partly because of my, my language ability. Uh, Pat Moss was in charge of that. I spoke French and Spanish. And then that was pretty short-lived. That company folded. And then I was recruited by John Weller to uh, Bertram. 
where I was for seven years. Oh, really? Yeah, because they were they were trying to get a sailing component with their boats, um, uh, and actually. Um, Richard Bertram was an America's Cup sailor, apparently. Yes. But then yeah. became very famous with, with his sports power fishing, boats. Yeah. Right. So uh, we did that, but then the company changed uh, ownership a lot and also management. So uh, Kevin invited me to join Northrop and Johnson, and I decided and to do that. And you've been here ever that. since. And loved it, loved it, loved it. And, it and you've it. certainly been a, a very successful sales broker. Any particular yachts that you've sold that stand out in your memory as, as being particularly valuable memories that you have? Well, I have great memories with all of them, really. Um, Ranger was one of the ones that was really um, special because um, the owner had been a client for a long time at different, he had bought Mustang years, years, years before. And so that was nice to have that uh, cycle with him. And, um, and then some of the power boats too. I had a wonderful client from Canada who bought a sailboat and bought a power boat, 164 footer. and sold a 200-foot Benetti, and so getting into the power boats has also been really fun. Yeah, you said that a 200-foot Benetti. It's, uh, I mean, that's a dream for many sales brokers to, mm-hmm. to, to sell a yacht of that size and with a, a reputable builder like Benetti as well. Two questions I have for you. First of all, as you know, the context of this discussion is the fact that it's the international, it's actually the International Women's History and Social Work Month in... Um, in March, over the years, both as a broker and when you were at sea, was being a woman a disadvantage or was it an advantage or was there a bit of both? Um, Okay, well, let me back up for a minute and just reiterate that one of the reasons I became a skipper was to learn what responsibility was. And as a captain, that really taught me what responsibility was. It was my fault if the chef left marmalade on the shelves. I mean, I understood that. And of course, when you run on the reef or when something happens, bottom line, it's always your fault. So that was really instrumental for me. I think one of the problems that women have is just what I expressed that my two wonderful men uh, warned me about is that they don't get out there and do it, that they don't think that they're worthy about doing it, uh, to do it. And I think that that can really hold women up. So I think in the time that I did it, one of the important things was to compete with the men because that's who your competition was. And we felt at a certain level you had to do what they did, but even better. Now, there were certain elements where I I knew that I didn't have the strength that my friend Franco did, for example, but I figured out right away that I would just go sooner to a mechanical way to do whatever it was, or to use judgment, or to use my resources, which might be another person to do it, uh, especially when you're in that leadership field. So I think that that was something that was important at the time and how to find, as a woman, how to find your own voice. I think now, as I've been almost 30 years as a broker even, what I'm finding is a more relaxed way to also be a woman in it and bring some of the resources and the natural qualities of a woman into the field. And one of those, for example, is relationship. Women are wired for relationship, and more and more, now that we are not kings and queens of the information, everybody's getting the information on the internet and many different sources. So now it's really the relationship, the trust you build. So women have a natural way to do that, I think. Uh, They have a natural nurturing sense that benefits a lot of people. So I think that's one thing that women can bring to the field now and now have a little bit more ability to do that in the milieu that we have. And that's also because, of course, men, uh, my uh, nieces, for example, I mean, they're married to men who are also changing the diapers and doing things like that. So anything we talk about with women can't be talked about isolatedly. It's also because of all of the men that help adjust to whatever it is also. And I just want to make that point that I'm very (laughs) grateful for all the men 
that have helped us when we have had no women. Now I think it's important for women to help each other also because there is a certain level of safety with women um, that you can expose yourself, you can be a little bit more vulnerable. Well, actually, my second question is kind of related and, and flows on to what you've just been saying, which is for, for young females who are watching this who aspire to do anything in the yachting industry, what would your advice be to them? Well, I would say, number one, really embrace and develop the growth mindset, which is a real glass ceiling for even young women now. And that's the fixed mindset, which is what I alluded to before, which is that it's just the way it is. I have to have everything perfect and before I can get out there. And they relate a lot to the past instead of to future possibilities. The growth mindset is one where you're looking at possibility, you become comfortable with discomfort, you have to be willing to do that, to step out, to make mistakes, understand that you can get mud on your face, it's no, nothing about your personality or you bad person sort of thing. No mud, no lotus. That's a Buddhist saying, right? That no you mud, need that. No, no mud, no lotus. I've Lotuses grow in mud yeah. from mud. Very good. And it's the same with us. That we need that kind of friction. We need that kind of that kind of learning uh, in order to grow. And so they have to be willing to be uncomfortable. They have to be willing to have mud on their face, and know that they're secure in their own wonderful worth. Annie, I feel like we've had some absolute nuggets of <laughs> wisdom and inspiration. Now, you've been 20 years, I think this year, with Northrop and yep. Johnson. So you go back right to the days of Rose Drive, or, or were they always yeah, at Rose yeah. Drive? No, just before that even, a little neighborhood uh, before that, before Rose Drive. It's been, it's been really wonderful to be with this company and to see how much we've grown and really the, the ethos of the company, I just love. It's what I think the whole world needs to go to more. This shift to really caring about people, not just the bottom line money, to caring about how you are as a person, how you be as a person, not just what you execute. And I think that that's really important. And collaboration is another thing that I think women can really uh, bring to the table. They, they, they have a sense of being in charge and being responsible for a community. And it's part of how we've been trained, right? Um, to be in charge of the family and people's health and growth. And so they already are wired and have many thousands of years of DNA of that. And they can bring that to the table too. It's happening more and more, where it's less competition, more collaboration, and really about the relationship. Cool, here he is, here's Daniel. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi Annie. Hi Daniel. We have a little surprise for you. My goodness, this really is a surprise. Come on, give me a hug first. Oh, <laughs> Happy your 20th pleasure. anniversary. Thank you for all your successes. Thank you.